I think we'll just go ahead and get started as folks are kind of still logging in. Uh, good morning and welcome to the Community Technical Assistance Center webinar on family alignment. Um, we have now been doing a series of webinars since February covering a variety of different topics and today is our final webinar in this series really focusing in on sort of application of caregiver in involvement strategies how to actually incorporate them a little more actively in addition to attending to some issues of engagement that's related to that. And what we hope today's webinar will really be is an opportunity for you to share your experiences, your questions, your comments, um, so that our presenters are, uh, who, who, can, who are really have been working in this area for quite some time and can share their expertise with you can help problem solve some of the application of some of the strategies you may have heard in the previous webinar, or even if you're new to this um, series, um, to really kind of just help you think through how to involve caregivers and services um, as much as possible. So we hope that this will be an opportunity to interact, for you to chat um, and, and share some of your experiences in addition to our presenters um, adding a little bit more content to the webinars that they had presented previously. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we just get started. Everybody is currently muted. We do ask that you use the chat box at the bottom right to submit any questions or comments or feedback. If you don't happen to see your chat box open, um, for example, there should be a hi everyone message from Brianna that you should see. If you don't see that, there's a little uh, bubble that says chat at the top right. You can click that icon and the chat box should pop up. Um, we will be happy to take any questions or comments throughout the webinar. At times we may hold a comment to, to a specific time during the webinar towards the end. So just feel free to keep submitting your, 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 your feedback um, all throughout the webinar as much as possible. We will also have a poll question pop up every once in a while where you get an opportunity to reply, click and answer and see what other folks are thinking uh, alongside of you as well who are on the webinar. So without further ado, um, we're very excited to have Susan Stern here with us again. She had presented uh, the first webinar in May on caregiver involvement strategies. We also have Deborah Langosh, um, who spent um, quite a bit of time in our last webinar really focusing on kinship care and involving grandparents and engaging them in services for kids. We have Cara Dina Sale on the line, who is part of the CTAC resource team. Jerry Burton and myself, Lydia Franco. Um, I'm just gonna briefly, we're gonna do a little bit of a review of our family alignment series, but then spend really the bulk of the time on caregiver involvement strategies and applying some of the content into your real world cases. Um, I do wanna highlight that if you are new or, or even if you attended some of the previous webinars in the series that you can still access all the webinar recordings, slides, and there were a number of tools like a family alignment checklist that can help you and self-assessing how well you're incorporating and engaging families in your services, as well as a tool for supervisors to use in supervision. So you can go to our ctechny.com website to access all those materials and that uh, really wonderful set of content, um, both from CTAC and some of our guest speakers. So we have a poll question. So it, this should have popped up in your right-hand side. Can you just let us know a little bit uh, 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 what you know so far about the Family Alignment Series? So have you been able to utilize any of the information from the series to this point? And again, that focus on the first 30 days and ways of collaborating, engaging with caregivers, um, involvement strategies. So if you can say yes, no, you just click the little circle next to your response, planning on it, or don't even know what it is. And essentially that applies if, if this is really the first time you've had a chance to be on, on one of the webinars in the series. So if we can just take a minute, we'd really appreciate to hear kind of where everybody is, because that'll help tailor the, how we present the content throughout the rest of the, web, rest of the webinar. So momentarily, we will um, uh, uh, close the poll, and then the results will pop up. Okay, so the results will pop up momentarily. Have you been able to utilize any of the information from the series? Yes, no, planning on it, or don't really know what it is? Okay, so that should pop up in a second. Sometimes there's a little bit of a delay. So we have a couple who have, um, some of you who, who are planning on it, 
a couple of you who are probably new to the series, and then there was a few of you who that weren't able to um, answer yet. So I, you know, so I think we have people in a variety of different places. It would be helpful that as we move forward, that those of you who have um, utilized some of the content to kind of let us know what you've utilized, and that um, we'll, we'll kind of we'll be asking you to submit that. And actually, you could probably go ahead and chat that in now. If you've used some of the content in the past, or even if you're planning on using it, um, which specific content and how? And, and if you've already used it, what was the feedback? What was the experience like? If you can go ahead and chat that in, uh, we'd appreciate it. In the meantime, as we're waiting for some of those responses, I just wanted to kind of ground everybody, especially those who are new, um, as to what our, our, our kind of uh, point of view is on, on this topic. And we really kind of think that engagement is about motivating and empowering participants to recognize their own needs, strengths, and resources, and to take an active role in changing their life. That engagement is really essential in the provider-family relationship from the moment a family is considered for treatment until they terminate or are discharged. But it really is a key aspect of working with children and families to really kind of think through how to engage the whole family and particularly the caregiver. We've shown this in the past, and I think this is a good visual to highlight our alignment model. And it says of the first 30 days, but I think it really kind of applies not just to the first 30 days, but throughout treatment, is that what we're trying to create with families, and particular caregivers, is a shared understanding of the treatment, that both the provider, the caregiver, and the youth are on the same page as to why they're coming for services, that there's clear roles between each of those three um, um, participants as to what their purpose is in the treatment, what is expected of everybody, that there's psychoeducation provided to inform everybody, both to the caregiver and the youth, and, and vice versa, to really kind of explain um, what the process looks like, as well as any information on the uh, challenges that are being experienced, that there's a true collaborative treatment plan, that choice, that parental and, and youth choice have really been incorporated in this process, and that providers and families are really working together um, to attend to the best needs of, of, of the child and family. Um, and that's really our, we're focusing on strengths, that there is agreement across all members and that we're highlighting strengths and what's working well in the families. We know that caregiver involvement is, is particularly important. Um, we know that is um, essential, essentially, to really see continued improvement in outcomes. Um, and, and even after they they finish services, it, it really helps support the family to build them up so they can attend to the issues on their own um, if caregivers have been involved. So really kind of thinking through how best, when I'm working with a child, when I have a child in front of me, how best can I engage that caregiver in this process? We know from the literature um, that most providers are really um, involving caregivers in some way. Usually it's around psychoed and treatment planning and information gathering or, or referrals. But I think what we want to highlight, and I think what seems to be clear from some of the research, is that oftentimes caregivers are involved uh, a little bit more marginally in, in the services, but not necessarily as part of active treatment. So the, really the, the part of the treatment where we start seeing improvements um, and, and really kind of thinking through, and, and, and I think we kind of challenge you to kind of think through how can we work collaboratively with caregivers in a way that's really meaningful to them and that really helps support improved outcomes. And Susan Stern, earlier in May, if you can check out that webinar recording, really spent some time highlighting some key strategies that you can utilize in your services when working with um, uh, caregivers and kids. So we have another poll question, just to kind of get a little bit of more of an understanding of, of your experience in involving caregivers. So what has your experience been in guiding caregivers to actively participate in their child's treatment? Um, so is it, I, I'm generally able to involve them with ease. It typically is not a, a big issue for me. I, I'm able to do that. You know, uh, or do you feel like it really varies? Sometimes I'm able to involve them in the more active parts of treatment, and sometimes I'm not. Um, or, you know, generally it's pretty challenging, maybe for the population I'm working with or in, 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 in the services that we provide. Um, you know, that I attempt to really uh, engage them, but that it's difficult and rarely ever works. Or that, you know, I'm really not, in, based on the population I'm working with or the services we provide, that I don't really, I'm not really able to engage caregivers at all in this way. So there's a couple different perspectives there. It would help us to know kind of where everybody is. We have a number of participants that have recently joined us. If you can take a second to click your, the reply and hit submit, we will close the poll. 
um, in just about a second, and then we'll see everybody's responses. Okay, so the uh, results will pop up momentarily again. So what has your experience been? Generally, it's been positive. We, I can involve them with a ease. It varies. You know, it's actually very challenging or I'm not really able to do it most of the time. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you for everybody who participated. Um, so I think generally, you know, we have a good kind of spread. It seems that most folks are either able to uh, involve them um, with ease or that it varies. There's a couple folks that identify that it tends to be a little more challenging or that they're not able to, and then a few folks that really didn't get a chance to reply. I think that, I think that really kind of just represents also where, where providers are in general, that you'll see oftentimes a variation. And it, it also just may vary depending on the family that you're working with or the circumstances of the case as well. So thank you everybody for participating. Now we hope to hear from you a, a little more directly. If you can just take a second and chat in, you know, for those of you who have said that you've used some of our strategies in the past or you have your own strategies that you've done to engage or involve uh, caregivers and services, um, what has been successful for you? What has worked for you? If you can take a second and chat in, what has, what has really helped you to kind of um, overcome some of those uh, challenges and, and involve caregivers successfully? For those of you who had responded that you find it to, to be a little more challenging or you're not really sure about how to go about doing that, can you let us know what you find challenging about the process? Because that then this is an opportunity to really engage our presenters to give some feedback um, and, and to help problem solve some of those um, issues as well as to share what has worked successfully with others. So I think we'll just take a, a few seconds if you can chat in. Um, as a reminder, when you see the send to, make sure you click on the drop down that you send to all panelists before you actually hit send. That way the panelists can um, uh, see your, your responses. Okay, so we have a, a, a one that's coming in. Please. Um, keep uh, letting us know what's working well, as well as what are the challenges that you've experienced, um, and make sure to hit send to all panelists before you actually hit the send button. So we have some that have said that they, they uh, what seems to work well is that they identify strengths, um, what you can see or have seen the caregiver do well with the child. So that really, you know, I think in our family alignment model, when we've um, talked about strengths and kind of highlighted that, that that seems to be actually a really positive way of engaging folks. Yeah. Susan's with me, and if you want to share, and Deborah, if you want to jump in. I was just going to say that one of the things that research has really supported as well is strength-based statements and reframing, which we've talked about a little, a little bit more today, really decreases some of the negativity and blaming, particularly when you have multiple family members in a session, like a caregiver mm -hmm. and adolescent, who disagree with one another. That's great, yeah, thank you. And we have a couple of folks that, oh, sorry, Deborah, did you wanna add something to that? Sure, um, that I think families get so easily overwhelmed that they forget that they have um, strengths and that there is resiliency that's helped them get through challenging situations in the past. And when we can remind them or help them access that, it sets them on a path that I think decreases the negativity and empowers them. Wonderful, yeah, and I think that's an important point to make. I, think, I know that when I've worked with families, oftentimes that's one of the hardest things to do is also help them to self-identify some strengths. So, so I, I really appreciate um, that that's something that you're all doing. We have a couple of folks that have identified some challenges. Um, so we have some that feel that there are systemic barriers um, that get in the way that it isn't so much caregivers. We have others that say sometimes it's caregivers, multiple responsibilities, and other kind of practical um, barriers that kind of get in the way of participating. Um, and that folks, so for example, we have somebody on who's uh, worked with uh, child protective services and often uh, finds that sort of the image and the view of them um, and the services that they provide oftentimes is a barrier in itself. So some really systemic and kind of perceptual barriers as well as some concrete barriers. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that, that we know is that we need to have the conversation with caregivers and with families around those barriers to help identify and see if we can collaboratively problem solve to help them overcome them. 
but the systemic barriers is really um, what we need to do as practitioners, social workers, psychologists, counselors, and agencies around the organization of services, not always entirely in our control, mm -hmm. but our systems are not always very responsive to families. Mm -hmm. So thank you for identifying that. I think that's a very big barrier for many families. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I, I think what I'll say, go ahead, Deborah, I'll, and I'll jump in after. Go ahead, Deborah. Okay, thanks. Um, I agree with what Susan's saying. And I think one of the, I, we hear it a lot in terms of what happens with ACS in New York City and our Child Protective Service component, that Initially, what can help a great deal is to clarify the role of, of the worker and also the array of services that can be offered. And I think that shifts the perspective sometimes that this is not just a negative um, intervention, but that you're there to also support the family or think about reunification or address the needs of the children in their care. And um, that can make a huge difference that, in terms of seeing the collaboration process and strengthening that. Great, thank you so much, Deborah. And I also just want to highlight, you know, that even if we don't have an opportunity to um, do something about some of those systemic barriers, I think at minimum it's important to discuss it and talk about it. So whether it's an experience of stigma, a misunderstanding of what the services are, um, whether it's just talking about some of those concrete obstacles like other responsibilities and things, I think at, at, at minimum is to have sort of a clear and honest conversation about that when we're first engaging families and even throughout the process because some of those barriers yeah. change throughout time and to really kind of process what that means for the family and if there's anything that can be done um, within your purview to attend to some of those challenges. I think even just having that conversation goes a long way um, and really builds empathy. And really validates their experience that, we've, that we're listening and they've been heard. Okay, thank you. So I'm just gonna highlight a couple of things. We just spent quite a bit of time uh, talking through this slide. So I encourage everyone, if you haven't seen it before, to go back to some of our webinars on engagement um, and involvement, because it highlights some key strategies, um, such as talking about past experiences with services and what uh, folks' perception of uh, stigma, instilling hope, focusing on strengths, um, some suggestions around identifying barriers and, and, and concerns that get in the way and just having some of those conversations. I think it's a good summary slide. We're just highlighting it again. You can access our slides on our CJACNY.com website. It may be good just to print this slide and, and, and put it up next to your computer, for example, to just keep reminding you of some of the strategies that we have found to be really successful in involving caregivers. So I'm now going to um, uh, pass it on to Susan, who's going to talk a little bit more about some involvement strategies for the next few minutes. But in the meantime, please keep chatting in, um, sending some feedback, comments, especially around some of these uh, key involvement strategies that Susan's identified. So hi, everyone, and um, um, welcome. And um, these slides are really review of some of the ones I presented on the previous webinar or looking at putting things together in a slightly different way. Okay. So um, Lydia's already um, talked about the evidence, and basically I wanna say that caregiver involvement, evidence-based treatment in child mental health is family-centered. And I said the caregiver involvement itself is an evidence-based process based on our understanding that it improves child outcomes and one that incorporates caregivers in implementing evidence-based treatment strategies. So I want to talk a little bit about the active participation after the initial engagement in some of those evidence-based treatment strategies in the middle phases. Sometimes we talk more about initial phase and we sort of don't move through. And we talked about some different roles, caregivers as collaborators, we've talked about throughout this series, as child coaches, as co-therapists for the child. But that treatment really is family-centered and relationally focused, and that's gonna be a big focus of our work in New York State moving forward, um, collaboratively working with families to support their children. Um, we talked a little bit about some of the common elements of evidence-based treatment, and I have some of those put together on the next slide, but some of those are common across diagnosis and ages, whether it's a child, young child, adolescent, such as psychoeducation, and some of that, those elements are diagnosis specific. So for example, time out for children with conduct or aggression problems, or avoiding excessive reassurance for child anxiety. We also talked about, and we'll briefly review, 
core methods. And these are methods like role play and modeling and problem solving. And they're the active methods that are not typically used, or at least at the intensity that um, they need to be used to have an impact. And of course, it's not just about techniques and methods. You all know that, that these families are complex, their lives are complex, but really looking at what some of the research says and how that translates into strategies about the therapy process. So I want to sort of boil it down to some, what are some of the key things about therapy that matters? And some of this is from the child mental health, but also really drawing on the family therapy process and outcome research. And that some of the key mechanisms of change within the family that's linked to child's mental health problems is really shifting parenting. That studies have shown that it's actually the change in parenting skills and the greater the magnitude in parenting skills and the caregiver-child relationship, the greater the change in the child's problem. But also we are needing to improve the interactional behavioral competency, so we are targeting child anxiety, child um, depression, um, children doing better in school. So we're improving both caregiver and children's competencies and modifying those maladaptive interactions in the, past, in the family. And then of course, um, and particularly in cases of, of trauma, in cases when children have been taken out of the home, um, repairing attachment and reconnecting family members. So those are some real key mechanisms of what needs to change with the family and how then our um, intervention strategies need to target that. Within the therapy process, um, again, um, through this entire series, we've talked about engagement and joining and therapeutic alliances. And when you have caregiver or multiple caregivers, because some of you have asked, what if there's, uh, is it different with a single parent versus if there are two caregivers? What about grandmother and mother? What about grandmother, her son, his wife, um, children, um, adolescent parents? Is that we need to balance those alliances and each person needs to be heard and understood. And we know that we need to reduce within session negativity and blaming. And we've already just talked about how strengths-based statements help that. Um, reframing helps that. Um, and it also helps to increase the within family alliance and develop a shared relational focus. So what I want to highlight is that reframing is one of your most powerful tools and to use freely. It operates, um, it sort of operates by allowing a way out of um, defensive spiraling, modulating emotion, giving folks different cognitive content. But when you're involving caregivers or multiple people, we're really looking at not just um, reframing an individual's behavior, but using relational reframes, because each person wants to know, what's in it for me? Can you help um, each family member? Can you help the family all together? Um, folks want to know, am, um, am I going to be um, blamed? The family members aren't so much resistant as they're scared. Perhaps they've had a thousand failures. So you can develop a relational focus around teamwork. In a recent Chinese family we worked with, the parents used the words harmony and the son agreed that they wanted to restore harmony in the family. Um, or just talking with a family, for example, as an adolescent, so you feel like you're just fitting in with your friends and what hurts you is when you feel your father doesn't trust you. And dad, when your son does not follow the rules, like coming home on time, you feel he does not respect you and that's what hurts you. So underneath all the anger is hurt and I'm guessing a little bit of sadness or a sense of loss because you no longer have the close relationship you both told me about. So I sort of moved into a little bit longer clinical example uh, to demonstrate when you do it relationally, you can then move to the theme of loss or hurt and it softens emotions and reconnects families with the concern and love that underlies the hurt and anger. And we've talked about the collaborative process and in some previous slides about staying on track and moving forward. Um, especially when there are impasse resolutions, and we can talk about that in the chat as well. But it's really balancing those relationship skills, the engagement skills, but also some structuring skills and more directive skills so that you keep the session on track, okay? Um, having a map to navigate, um, this is nothing new, but I thought it might be helpful to sort of take a look and see things pictorially, that sometimes what happens when we're saying that um, um, Caregivers um, have said they've tried things before, they don't listen, it's not working, is that we really move too quickly into the middle phase. Perhaps we didn't um, complete the beginning phase, or perhaps we need to recycle and go back because an impact has built up. 
And then in that middle phase are some of those critical skills that need to be filled, um, built. These are those common evidence-based practice elements that are associated with change in families and children, and those active core methods that we talked about. And we haven't really talked about generalization and maintenance, um, and that's something you, you know and we all um, uh, need to do in this work, okay? So um, I often, when I'm supervising or when I'm working with students, think about when they tell me they're stuck and they're either giving advice prematurely, they're feeling the pressure in the first session about all the issues in the family, they're beginning to try to get the family to communicate differently and it's not working, or they're in the middle phase and um, these are some of the things that have come up in previous webinars. Um, that parents, caregivers have said, I've tried that before, nothing gets through to him, I can't, or we say they don't listen, is think about where are you in the map? You know, treatment is phasic, and most of um, the evidence-based family approaches, the parenting approaches, have these different phases. It doesn't matter which approach you're using or you're drawing across some, but have you completed the engagement phase and established the foundation for behavior change? And are those strategies you're introducing maybe in the middle stage, such as time out, in alignment with family goals and values and cultures? Not you need to have um, that conversation. And most importantly, because the middle phase really is about skill building for the child, for the adolescent, for the caregivers, that we often talk about teaching skills and our studies show that therapists teach behaviors common to skills building or using confrontation increases caregiver disengagement. Even talking about how we know that this works, we've worked with other families, and we sort of very inadvertently um, convey the message that if you just did this, it might work also. So I just wanted to highlight that. So Susan, what you're saying is that typically what has been found when it's been studied is that teaching or confrontational behaviors tend to create disengagement. Right? Exactly. It's really those two behaviors that yeah. get in the way. And so one of the issues is when we refer parents to parenting groups and then in parenting groups, some of the groups are really about teaching parents parenting skill, what message that conveys versus some of the groups are really very collaborative, mm -hmm. but first we have to have completed that first uh, stage and engaged folks before that referral, right? And even when um, caregivers are mandated, and Deborah can speak to this into parenting groups, being present doesn't really mean being fully engaged. So some of the things that helps is focusing on a listening behavior rather than teaching and coaching. And I think we saw that in the role play on the webinar um, where Kara Play the therapist and really helped um, coach a caregiver through practicing, um, role play practicing how to praise her son. We've talked about reframing and support and struggling and working through, letting um, caregivers and, and family members sort of struggle, but sticking with them, um, and that we're not talking about um, using strategies perfectly, but working through how that works through the family. This is tough, this is hard work. Role-playing minimizes that teaching behavior um, because you can reflect on it, see how that went, practice again, and problem solving. And for those of you familiar with structural family therapy or attachment-based family therapy, the use of enactments, it releases the family member's own resources to solve problems, so it decreases that teaching behavior. So in the next two slides, um, just very briefly, what I put together is what's common across some of those active methods that we need to use more of, use with greater intensity, use with greater fidelity. So role plays, problem solving training, and home tasks. And in the previous webinar, you'll find each of these spelled out with what I hope um, are hopeful steps and tips. Um, and I'm sure that some of you have done that. I'm perhaps seeing it all together is helpful. But I pulled out what's common across them. So they're all performance-based methods that activate interaction and practicing new skills and ways of relating, both in session and at home. You're not talking about it, you're doing it. And again, research has shown that practice with old child or role-playing makes a difference across some of these approaches. So for all of them, I really want to emphasize setting them up for success to begin with. So back to what I um, indicated in terms of that map, is you can only really introduce those change strategies successfully after the negativity and blaming has been reduced. And there's a collaborative focus. The family wants to work together. Targeting real-life problems and situations, 
um, beginning with a meaningful but a doable issue. Don't start with the most difficult problem the family experiences. And the connection to how your proposed intervention aligns with their goals may be clear to you, but really making that explicit and inviting their participation. Um, in the facilitating change phase, we've already talked about coaching, really reinforcing and using reframing, but without interrupting the process. So quickly getting in and out, punctuating and celebrating just small successes, and that you use these in-session tasks, whether they're problem solving, role plays, to promote new skills and competencies, but to really disrupt old patterns by creating new interactions. And then again, taking that to the home. The other thing is increasing arousal and targeting more difficult areas with caregivers and family members as they sort at, with each role play, with each problem solving, so that they're doing it in the midst of emotional arousal so it's real life. And then for all of these, you really want to pay attention to debriefing and reviewing, eliciting first the family's views, and then adding your feedback in a supportive um, and learning way for them. Great. Thank you so much, Susan. So I think that, so there was a lot of content there, and what I want to highlight is that if you go back to Susan's webinar, um, you get to see the recording where she went into a little bit more detail about the role plays and how it can be utilized as well as some of the other um, strategies. So I think it, it may be helpful to kind of look at that webinar, um, at least look at some of those slides um, and uh, get a little bit more um, uh, more extensive kind of content around some of those strategies. We do think that they're important strategies to utilize, um, and you can also access these slides and the recording at our website as well. So I did want to move on to Dr. Deborah Langosh, who did want to talk a little bit more about caregivers and kinship care. Um, but in the meantime, please start sending some feedback. I uh, chatted out a, a question. Um, let us know what has worked for you in incorporating caregivers. What specifically have you done? Um, to incorporate caregivers in this process. We want to be able to share some successes with everybody uh, online as well. So if you can kind of chat that through as we're going through the content, appreciate it. Deborah? Sure. Um, thank you, and I appreciate all of the participants and your interest in these topics. I'm wondering before I talk about kinship care, there was a good comment about um, the process of contracting, and it follows very nicely in terms of what Susan was saying. And one aspect of that, um, the question was how is the process different from the process of contracting? I think what's essential is that the engagement has to happen first. You don't want to set up a contract without it having a collaborative feel and um, essence to it. And so if the engagement has happened, then you work on a mutually agreed upon contract. And we just want to make sure this, the sequencing and the phasing of that is, is um, highlighted. Okay. So in terms of kinship um, care, um, just to clarify so we're all on the same page because kinship care means different things to different people. Um, it occurs when parents are unable to care for their children and rely on relatives to raise them on a full-time basis. This is considered a permanency option for children and parental rights don't need to be terminated. Um, it can happen for many reasons and in many different ways. And we know that grandparents um, are the um, kin caregivers who are more predominant, but it's, these days also we are seeing great grands and nieces and uh, aunts and uncles and cousins and also older siblings who are raising younger siblings. Uh, the most predominant reason this is happening is because of substance abuse of the parents, abuse and neglect and mental illness, but there are many other challenges that face families that cause relatives to come forward and um, take the responsibility of raising their relative children. So how do you engage um, this particular population? We want to think about um, what's the plan and what's the vision. And I think what Susan was saying earlier about setting attainable goals, um, making sure that there are short-term options and that families can reach those and have a sense of success with them. And then we want to make sure we're all communicating what that vision is thinking about how do you empower the family, how do you um, promote self-determination and a sense of agency, and um, consolidate those gains. We want to strengthen those approaches and reinforce the positive change that can come as a result. 
So our program um, is funded by New York State, and um, we do it's an integrative healthcare model where we provide comprehensive case management to really think about how do you best support and stabilize families. And we have a warm line that, that caregivers call. Typically, they're overwhelmed, they're frustrated, they're afraid, they're isolated, and many times defeated. They volunteer to um, assume care of the children, but aren't getting the support or the financial entitlements or the benefits that they need, and really at a, are at a point where it's overwhelming to them. Um, many times they're given incorrect information, they've been denied benefits, um, and usually what we find is the initial requests are for help with very basic needs. Um, it's difficult for them sometimes to say, I need help, but if it's for the child or children they're raising, that allows an easier access. And essentially, they're doing all they can and are really making tremendous sacrifices, but then encounter overwhelming system, uh, system barriers and obstacles that can feel as if they just are never going to be able to get around them. Um, and often these are needed just to get through a, a life on a day-to-day -day basis. So what do we do to engage skin care families? Um, we have our warm line set up. We do an initial intake over the phone. We talk about the range of services. Um, we talk and look at what are some of the goals that um, they would like help with, and this is um, put forward in a service delivery plan, and we revisit this every quarter to update. Um, we have bilingual workers so that families are um, can speak in their primary language and feel heard in that way. And we try our best to respond to the needs of the caregivers. Um, often our staff provides advocacy and navigation through complex systems such as housing or um, HRA in New York or Department of Social Services, um, through um, Child Protective Services. And it allows the caregiver to feel that they're being heard and that they have a voice in the process. Um, this, in turn, decreases a sense of isolation, and we try to meet the caregivers where it's best for them. So whether that's a home visit, whether it's at a city agency office, whether it's in the school, um, but to try to relieve the pressure of managing so much and to think about, you know, what are the family's strengths and how do we mobilize support. And initially, our approach is one of triage. Um, families may call and, and may have many things that they're struggling with, but um, we help them to establish what are the priorities um, and think about this being kind of the tip of the iceberg. Um, whatever we can be done to um, really work on a greater sense of safety and developing trust is essential. And then what families are able to do as they feel safer is begin to address not just the practical needs, but the underlying psychological, mental health, sometimes their health, sometimes their substance abuse issues, and um, loss and trauma, which we know affects the majority of our families. Okay. Um, and we try then to get to really the heart of family dynamics and issues. Um, these can include a caregiver's sense of helplessness. They often blame themselves. The parent becomes demonized in the process. Um, there's a general sense of, of things being out of control. And there's a quality call of uh, developmental dissonance that for many of our caregivers is not what they imagined they would be doing at this point in time in their lives. Um, they th might have thought that they would be retiring or traveling or having uh, a different lifestyle and not that they would be raising young children, um, preparing lunches, changing diapers, going to school meetings, going to therapy and medical appointments. And so th there needs to be adequate acknowledgement of that and time in terms of um, adjusting to that new role that they're in. It's often hard for them to understand children's behavior and struggles and not know that it may be related to underlying emotional issues or responses to trauma and loss. And there are fears of the future. What's going to happen if I get ill, if I die? Who's going to take care of the children? Um, am I going to be around long enough to really help them to grow? And there's a very strong need and wish to keep their children safe, but not always knowing how to do that. And often those are discussions that we have as we work through this. 
So the importance um, there of a number of areas, psychoeducation, uh, especially about mental health and substance abuse issues, preventive care, um, helping families to learn to shift perspectives, and much of this Susan spoke about as well, improving family communication, and clarification of roles and boundaries, um, helping them get access to comprehensive, culturally sensitive evaluations and assessments. Um, and I can't emphasize that enough. And learning about treatment options once diagnosis is made and helping to destigmatize some of the worry and shame that can be attached to that. Um, also, how do they get access to services without long waits? And many of our families don't know that, for example, that Medicaid and Medicare can help cover the cost of therapy so that that doesn't need to be a barrier to their getting help. Um, when we think about some problems in engagement, um, what we often hear is that their expectations aren't met. And that can be avoided, I think, if we're very clear about what their expectations are and that we can clarify what's possible and what isn't. Um, misalignment in terms of misunderstandings and miscommunication. Um, and families sometimes feel they should have access to more than what's currently available. They may also be wary and worried about revealing information because of risks to them or their children. And so critical information is withheld. What happens if a caregiver has a substance abuse problem or the parent is visiting and they're not really supposed to be there? Um, and yet all of these have tremendous impact on the family um, and really do need an opportunity to be aired and looked at and, and think, thought about in terms of services. Um, we want to think about why caregivers might be reluctant to engage. Um, have they had negative experiences with other workers or therapists in the past? Has their sense of trust been violated? Um, we want to help identify and think about what are some of the practical barriers to um, having them participate and to really focus and make sure that we are um, thinking about this in the context of being culturally, um, having cultural humility and thinking about the impact of race and, and what that means. And also, again, again, listening for strengths and building on those characteristics. So we know that families need safety and stabilization. Their lives have been often turned upside down by all the events that have caused the child to come into care. They need trauma-informed and culturally competent care. We want to make sure they get um, linked to evidence-based treatments. And we want to think about how do we create some cross-pollination of services across systems so families don't have to do so much for each specific one. And our role is to think creatively and collaboratively to address gaps in services and policies, how to thinking about pooling resources effectively, as, as I mentioned, destigmatize counseling and therapy, and linking families to evidence-based treatments. And there are an array and many that we know are, are very effective. And I'm going to stop there. Great. Thank you so much, Deborah. So I think what we heard from uh, from you was um, really a, a number of things to really take into consideration working with kincare families, but it also sounds to me that many of those are some of the same conversations to be had, whether or not a child is in kincare or not, um, but that we really are talking about some core strength-based engagement and involvement strategies. And then what I hear from Susan's presentation is also, well, no matter the family dynamic or structure, that there's a number of very specific sort of clinical, practical strategies to utilize, like role playing, to really get at some of the, the challenges to help support families in building skills and help to um, really support them in improving and getting through treatment in a more effective way. Susan, did you want to respond to anything? Well, I also just want to say your comment about contracting, Deborah, and the importance of engaging first and that these things operate in order, I think, is, is very consistent. Um, in the chart I put up, I actually try to put some things yes. in an order. So that contracting leads to that collaborative treatment mm -hmm. planning, so the treatment planning is, is transparent, is done together. Um, and then I think that, you know, I, I um, so pleased to hear about the way these two kind of fit together is that sometimes when we're in child welfare settings or families are otherwise mandated, it's really important we clarify our roles, we have responsibilities, but that may come across in a way that's here are the resources, here are the things that, you know, we can offer you, here are the things you need to do rather than that engagement phase, and, and what do you need? What do you think you need? Um, what would you like to have happen? 
Um, and I, I can think of a case that a parent started crying and said, nobody asked me that before. So it's really about that engagement, always keeping in consideration issues of safety, but without that engagement, we can't mm -hmm. do the work. Great, thank you. And I also just want to uh, highlight that we really want sort of the rest of the time we have together to hear some of your strategies. What have you utilized in the past that's been successful? We haven't seen anything come in just yet, so I'm hoping everybody's you know writing in their responses now. What has worked for you? What are some specific challenges you've experienced, whether working with kin care families or not, whether they're involving or engaging caregivers? Um, really kind of thinking through how to actively involve them throughout the process of, of, of services. So if you can just take a minute, really, or really a few seconds to kind of chat in in that chat box, make sure you send to all panelists and then hit send. I think it would be really helpful for us to hear from you. And if you have any specific cases or, or case studies that you'd like to help us problem solve with you, I think this is a great opportunity to kind of um, use the, the, the resources that you have available to help kind of think through some of these cases. So, um, so please go ahead and, and chat it. And Lydia, while that's happening, there was a question um, about kinship relatives who are undocumented, and I just wonder if I can address that. Oh, please um, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That's a really critical issue, and I think families are understandably very, as you say, wary and worried that if they reach out for help that they will be reported or deported. Um, and so how do they make that initial call when they are um, sometimes not eligible for a lot of services and, and questioning how safe it is? Um, what we find is that we um, do a lot of outreach and will let um, the agencies and programs and caregivers that we work with know that we are not restricted and that we can work with undocumented families as well as documented. And we clarify what our role is. It is not to you know, report them to immigration, but it's to help stabilize and support the family. Um, and that we understand that there are fewer options for them, but that um, we will do all that we can to support and help them. And I hope that that responds to your question. Thank you so much, Deborah. So I, I don't see any sort of challenges coming up yet or, or um, any specific case studies yet. I think we'll give folks another few seconds to kind of, sometimes there's a delay in receiving um, some of the chats. We'll give you a few more seconds to, to chat in. Hi, this is Susan. So we haven't seen any chats yet about um, what specific caregiver involvement strategies did you try? And so I'm wondering about, is there something that's resonated with you from the last webinars that you haven't had a chance to try, but you think is something that you would like to do differently in your work? We'd love to hear your feedback and what you found helpful and think that you might want to try with your client. So Great. if you could take a few seconds to chat that in. Thank you so much, Susan. So as you're chatting those that in, we have a couple comments that came in. And Deborah, it looks like maybe there's a question for you. What do you do when the kin abandons youth in residential care and counties will not take custody? Do you have any recommendations around that? That's a uh, good question. Um, and it's complicated. Um, so if, if youth is being placed in residential care, usually the caregiver has become um, overwhelmed by the responsibility of raising that child and the psychiatric needs and, uh, and behavioral issues are uh, you know, paramount and, and beyond the scope of what a caregiver can do. Um, I think while they're in care, it's always good to engage that caregiver and to see what can be done um, in terms of putting services in place or enough support for the caregiver to consider whether it might be an option for them to be returned. Um, when I, I would wonder why counties would not take custody at that point, and I think it would also depend on what the legal status is that the kin caregiver has prior to the point of, of placement. So 
I, I might need to know a little bit more about that um, because I would think that if the caregiver is relinquishing custody, um, the county would have to have a responsibility to make a long-term permanency plan or think about um, a foster, a different kind of foster care placement afterwards. Great, thank you so much, Deborah. And, and I, yeah, so Elaine, if you have any additional sort of clarification that you can send to us, is it true abandonment where they're relinquishing rights? Is it that they're just not being responsive? Um, uh, you know, if you can kind of clarify that, then we can give you some more specific feedback. Um, I also want to highlight, um, you know, some folks who kind of were saying some things that have worked, and they found that in the engagement phase, um, really acknowledging caregivers and the child's anger or feelings um, uh, that they're experiencing may be helpful. Um, and that really kind of just processing that feelings aren't bad, um, that they're real, that they're true to you, um, and, um, and this kind of takes away maybe some of the negative feelings that the family may have around um, what they're experiencing as well as participating in services that generally has been a positive yeah. experience. Excuse so me. thank you so much for that comment. And I think um, what you're saying in a way is that acknowledgement is really validating what people, what each person is feeling mm -hmm. as, as well as in a little bit your, mm -hmm. um, your uh, all of a sudden I'm forgetting the word, um, making it natural. Um, yeah. I, so I can't think of the word right now. But it's based on their feelings because they're connected. And I think what you said about connected is the really important point. If you can get to that connection, to the underlying love, perhaps um, they're struggling with the feelings and what feels so bad mm -hmm. is because this isn't what they want in their family. Often yeah. there's a loss of dreams, of hopes, feeling abandoned, feeling the other person doesn't care, doesn't understand them. So they're really just stuck right now and maybe what all two of them or what all three of them or all four, all four of them are struggling with. And it's just not working right now, but they want it to be different. It hurts because they're connected and, um, and, and these feelings just don't feel good. So I think that's really important and, and what you mostly said there is that connection piece. Great, um, thank you. So I have a... Um, uh, Elaine also kind of replied uh, a little bit, in, 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 uh, Deborah, in terms of how could you re-engage that family? I think that's in response to your um, feedback. Good. Um, and Elaine, thank you for posing that question. I think you have to start with what happened for the caregiver. What were their expectations? What didn't work? Um, what could have been put in place to support them better? Um, and to consider what the, what the caregiver's needs are and to look at what the um, external factors were that were interfering in that process and also what was interfering with the caregiver's sense of success in taking care of, of this child. Um, was the child so impaired when they first came into care that it, this was really beyond the scope of what they could do? And residential care obviously is, is a huge step, but would that, is that a necessary piece that then stabilizes the child adequately for the caregiver with um, a sense that they're being heard and that there's a respected and responsive treatment plan um, as an opportunity to re-engage and think about the child's return. Thank but you I think so much. Start correct. with 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 what didn't go right. What where were the problems in this, and um, and then how to respond differently to that. Great, thank you so much. So I think we have sure. one more question and then we'll probably wrap up. So this question is really about troubleshooting the use of role playing as a technique in treatment um, and if you have any recommendations around uh, getting buy-in. Yeah, so again, thank you for that question. And again, the first thing I'll say is it goes back to are you in the middle phase of treatment? Are you engaged? So we've said that. Um, but then really importantly, linking the role play to the presenting problems to the caregiver child and child's goals to make sure that the role play you're proposing aligns with their goals, acknowledging that it feels a little silly, um, see what words the caregiver the family is using, are they talking about play acting, rehearsal, uh, we don't need to use the language of role play also, we can use language um, that fits with them, that's, you know, in terms of practicing some things before trying to take it home, um, acknowledging it and maybe proposing it as an experiment, trying it on a little bit. But also I keep it really brief um, uh, initially, at least the first time, keep it really brief, be really reinforcing about it, and make sure that the, the caregiver, the child, whoever you're doing it with, 
really sees the value of it. If that's not working, then perhaps you need to have a conversation about what the barriers to that are. But usually, um, in my research, we found that it's often the workers that are reluctant or uncomfortable in proposing it. So I think it's great that you try that. So we actually, so we uh, we just got a little case example. I'm thinking maybe we could take the last minute to focus on that. Um, so youth in residential care with disruptive behaviors discharged due to behaviors. The parent, youth, and direct care staff are not told about the discharge until the day of because it's felt that the youth may become violent if he knows. The parent is not told because of fear that the parent will tell the youth. Staff is not informed for fear that they may might accidentally tell the youth out of frustration. What is the family to do? So that's an extremely complicated example, and there seems to be a lot of fear in every different direction. Um, any any talk initial about, thoughts, Deborah? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> talk, about, well, talk about lack of communication and planning. That is astounding. Um, it, it's very worrisome because it's, a, it's, it's setting this up to fail. Um, and it looks like everyone needs to take a step back and, and delay the discharge um, until another, you know, communication can happen, another plan is put into effect, um, that there's agreement and buy-in. Um, this just is a setup that, that it will backfire. Yeah, absolutely. And I also think to take responsibility for it um, mm -hmm. so that the blame isn't on these different people, so it's not about, um, uh, who's going to get violent, who's going to get scared, who's not prepared, but take responsibility that we need to take a step back and didn't properly have this discussion. Yeah, and it sort of it sort of just leads me to a thousand other questions that yeah. we may not have time to get into, but what I see here happening is um, limited communication with family and what is the fear there, you know, what is actually happening, is there a way to kind of open up those lines of communication in a more strength-based and positive way? Is there a way to have communication with the youth? And it seems that there's some concerns around his behaviors. Maybe he's explosive in some way. Um, but we're kind of, it, it seems to me that the processes are also disengaging everybody else, right? So, it, it, and that may be contributing to some of the challenges that everybody's experiencing. Right? Absolutely. And this goes yes. back to everything we've talked about through this entire series about engaging, involving, and working with caregivers and families all along. Mm -hmm. This shouldn't be happening at the last minute, this discharge. And yeah. if, um, if, if, if the process was collaborate, mm -hmm. collaborative, and that begins on day one, not a discharge. Yeah, yeah. So, Sue, so I'm not sure if we, we were able to give you some concrete um, uh, strategies, but I, I think we do agree as it seems that you do that that's a particularly challenging situation and and kind of maybe thinking through that discharge if at all possible would be helpful. Um, so I just want to say we are at the end of our time. Thank you so much to Deborah Langosh and to Susan Stern for um, being on today's webinar, providing us with some additional content information. I highly, highly recommend that everybody go to our CTAC website, ctacny.com. Check out our family alignment series. There's about nine webinars there, including today's, that has recordings and slides and handouts and tools to guide you in actively engaging caregivers and working with families as a whole in, in providing services and, and supporting kids' outcomes. Our next Lunch and Learn uh, webinar is the role of racial trauma and psychotherapy, so I do want to highlight that. There's one CEU available for that. That's July 23rd, 12 to 1. Check it out on our website at ctacny.com. You can register through there or just check your emails for announcements. Um, we have a children's summit um, for providers um, out there who, um, I'm sorry, I don't, you may not have actually seen those slides. So this was ctacny.com website. The next Lunch and Learn is the role of racial trauma and psychotherapy, July 23rd, 12 to 1. Um, and then we also have our Children's Summit, that's uh, June 29th and 30th, June 29th here in New York City, June 30th in Albany. Anybody who's interested, provider agencies are interested in participating in that, please go to our website to get some more information and learn about that registration process. And here are Susan's and Deborah's emails who so graciously are open to receiving feedback, comments, and questions. Feel free to reach me, Lydia Franco, at lydia.franconyu.edu as well. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time today to, to participate. We hope that this was helpful and informational um, and, and supportive for you in your work. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye.